So I'm going to talk about this KKV conjecture. Uh, This is how to write a math paper in English or something? Yes, yes. <laughs> My Russian's OK. <laughs> I, think, I think the title of the JPEG was how to write a, a math paper in English. OK. Uh, so I'm going to talk about gromov witten theory, uh, and in particular the hard part, which is uh, multiple covers which are conjecturally understood by something done by the string theorist, Gopakuma Vafa. I'll explain that. Um, and then I, I do it all in the case of K3 surfaces and K3 fibrations. And I'll explain the KKV conjecture. And then the way we prove it is using a completely different theory called stable pair theory. So I give a review of that and then explain the main tool, which is degeneration and relative theory, and the huge tool, which is something called the MNOP conjecture. OK, so uh, gromov witten theory is nonlinear, and so it's very hard. In particular, you need two fields medalists to sort it out just for a point, so the theory of mapping curves to a point. Um, and then it was also worked out by Maxime for P2, just in genus 0, which is also somewhat kind of more linear. Um, and it's since been worked out for a curve, so we now know how many curves there are in a curve. Uh, by Kunkov Pandra Panda. And there's some understanding of surfaces due to tabs and the Gutsch conjecture. Uh, but really, what we want to understand is Gromov Witten theory of three folds. And uh, that's very difficult. But there's this wonderful thing called the MNOP conjecture. And uh, that's been proved by both toric varieties and most Calabi R three folds. So Calabi R three folds that can be degenerated to unions of toric varieties. Uh, by Pandra, Pandra, and Pixton. Uh, and so this talk's kind of an exercise in using that progress to try and compute the gromov witten theory of K3 fibered three folds. Um, it's still very difficult. You still have to compute the stable pair theory, which is somewhat more linear, but it's still, it's still very difficult. And you've still got to compute all these multiple covers and so on, but that's what we do. That's what we'll do in this talk. Uh, so in particular case of K3 services, in genus zero, uh, there was this yao zaslow conjecture in 1995, which we've heard about before, involving modular forms. And so it's proof for primitive classes, so classes which aren't multiples of other classes, uh, by Beauville and Brian Conan Lung, who's here. And then in all classes, but in a very roundabout way, by invoking mirror symmetry uh, in genus zero, so relating it to variations of Hodge structure on the other side. And then for the full gromov witten theory of K3 and all um, genera, there's this katz klem waffer conjecture, which I'll explain later. And uh, again, it's been proved in primitive classes. Um, but today, we're going to deal with all classes and all multiple covers. OK, so I give some brief review of gromov witten theory. Um, so I'm not going to do anything symplectic, so I'll always be working with a smooth projective variety, some homology class. Then there's a moduli space of stable maps, Maxim's moduli space of stable maps. Um, so you take uh, holomorphic or algebraic maps of curves into your variety. And the curve is, is rather nice. It's almost smooth. The, uh, the worst case is that it can be nodal. Um, but the map can be hideous. But there's one condition, one stability condition, that the automorphisms are, are finite. So automorphisms of the curve which commute with the map. So if the map contracts a P1 or something, then you'd get lots of automorphisms which would commute with the map. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow that, unless the P1 had lots of special points. So uh, there's a moduli space of these things. It's a delete mumford stack because there's some these finite automorphisms coming from here. And then the space of deformations minus the space of obstructions has a constant dimension given by a Riemann-Roch formula. This is called the virtual dimension. It's given by this formula. And so that this fact, this says roughly that the, the space is cut out um, from 
by a bunch of equations in a bunch of unknowns, and the difference between the two is constant. So you might imagine um, that you could perturb those equations and get some kind of cycle of actual dimension this. So in general, the moduli space has too high a dimension, but you can get a cycle of actual dimension this um, done by uh, Lee and Tian and Baron Fantecchi, again pro proposed by Maxime. And this is called this virtual moduli cycle, and this is what replaces the moduli space. So the moduli space has the wrong dimension, but you use this cycle and you integrate against it. And this gives you gromov witten variants, and they're rational numbers because of this, uh, these automorphisms. Okay. So there you go. That's gromov witten theory in a slide. So uh, this example is conics in P2. So you might have some conics x squared equals ty squared in P2 degenerating to a double line. And in stable map land, the degeneration is rather different. So you might take the embedding of the P1 as this conic here, and then in the limit, you can't take this uh, scheme here because that's not a stable map. That's not a nodal curve. Um, so what you, what you end up with, you find the limit of the equations, the, these parameterized curves, is the double cover of this line. So the thin line, x equals 0, gets double covered. Uh, the branch points of the double covering are the intersections of these nearby conics with this line. I think your glasses is wrong. X squared is equal to PY squared. It's two lines. Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Whoops. OK. <laughs> Put some other conic here degenerating to this. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> Need your advisor to sort it out. OK, here's another example of cubics. So uh, this, the example's in black. These are smooth elliptic curves. Imagine uh, cubics in P2 degenerating to a, um, a rational cubic curve, so uh, a cuspidal elliptic curve. So uh, one way of getting that is you, you could imagine a smooth family of elliptic curves, blow it up at a point, and you get a smooth family of elliptic curves, except the central fiber is an elliptic curve with a P1 attached. And now that elliptic curve is negative in this surface, so you can contract it. And when you do, you don't just contract this curve, you also contract an infinitesimal direction up the P1. And so what you end up with is not a P1, but a P1 with a cusp. And um, so here's a family of curves. And again, you could take the embedding of this elliptic curve as a stable map, and then you can ask, what's the limit in the moduli space of stable maps, which is supposed to be a projective delete mumford stack, so it must have a limit. And the limit is this guy up here. So in the limit, you get this cuspidal curve. You can't just embed a cuspidal curve. That's not a stable map, because you've got worse than nodal singularities. But the limit is this guy. So um, it's this map here. This is a nodal curve. And the blowdown map, um, um, this curve might have, this curve C bar has automorphisms, but the one which, which fixed this point um, are finite. So you get finite automorphisms of this curve fixing this point. And so th those are the automorphisms of this map, so that's actually a finite group. But yeah, the limit stable map is from this nodal curve here to this. And you can see now you get this moduli space can be horrible, much bigger, because now, because you're contracting this curve, you can imagine you can now vary this curve, and you get the whole moduli space of elliptic curves with one marked point. Uh, you could attach to this P1 and also map those to this. So you end up with this huge orbifold, much bigger moduli space, big mess. And in gromov witten theory, you have to do integration over such so-called degenerate contributions, where you have a P1 with an elliptic curve attached, and that elliptic curve is allowed to vary through the moduli of elliptic curves, and you have to take integrals over that moduli space. And that gives you the gromov witten theory sort of contributing to this point here. But so that's one reason why you get rational, uh, rational numbers. This is another reason. This double cover here counts as a half. But there's this BPS formalism, which tells you there must be some underlying integers. So you can see in this case, there's a half here. In my class, two times a line. In the class of a quad a conic, there's this half uh, counting this double cover here. And then there's all the other double covers. But there's an underlying integer, which is the, the 1 counting the embedded line in half the homology class. And the BPS formalism tells you that that's kind of universal. Once you know the, the invariance, there are some integer invariants um, in some smaller homology classes. 
And once you know those, there's universal formulae which tell you where all the rational numbers come from. They tell you about all these multiple covers. So this, this is all conjectural due to Gopakuma Vafa. What you do for the purposes of this talk, it's just numerology. So you rewrite these rational numbers in terms of equivalent numbers by this formula. And uh, th this is a, these are equivalent data. So given these Gromov-Witten invariants, you get these BPS numbers. Given a set of BPS numbers, you get Gromov-Witten invariants. And you can see roughly why is because this, the power expansion of this sign here to first order when d equals 1 gives you this term here. So this is some upper triangular linear. Uh, there's some infinite matrix, which is upper triangular, relating these numbers to these numbers. And it's got ones on the diagonal, so it's completely invertible transformation. And conjecturally, these numbers are integers now. So this, this encodes all the multiple covers. So that means in particular that all the denominators in the ground things come from binary numbers. Uh, yeah, well, I would ask you that. Is that correct? Well, OK. Powers of sign are essentially higher than something very OK. Yes. Conjecturally. So in particular, they're very restricted. And the, yes. The, the denominator can't be very big. That's right. So, so here, x is a threefold, or x is anything? <coughs> well, there we go, yeah. Well, x is more or less anything, actually. Conge conjecturally, one can also do this. Once you put appropriate insertions in, in and so on, and, and get numbers, then Rahul Pandra Panda ICM talk conjectures that this also holds. Yeah. But the physics derivation only applies to Calabi R threefold. The, the Gopakuma Vafa only conjectured this for Calabi R threefold. So Rahul has an extension in. Well, let me let me be careful. He has an extension for arbitrary threefolds, and you get versions for surfaces and so on from that. Maybe. Yeah, you're right. No, in higher dimensions, that's. Um, he has other papers conjecturing there should be some integer structure, but it's not entirely clear what it should be. Yeah, in fact, it was another source of integer structure derived right, from Peter Truss and integer numbers, which are a theoretic uh, uh, invariants by given pair. For example, consider this stack of the stable maps to three Calabriano. It's kind of horrible little map of stack. You consider H, uh, error recluse, early homomorphic recluse of shift four. It's okay. an integer number. Yes. And given that formalism gives some, some kind of formula express from Trunas or upper triangular matrix, uh -huh. but nobody knows whether they are uh, couple of or not. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know. And it actually will give another approach to integrative who will work if you because the universe of the and you know the relation if you, the relation between Kobakum Rock and given that is integer, mm -hmm. then it's a whole integer, yeah. And there, there are other now approaches that Ian L and Parker have some integers. And um, these stable pairs we'll talk about later are integers. And anyway, it's clear that underlying Gromov Whitney variants, sh then there are some integers. But some things are proved, some things are not. OK, so you're not supposed to understand this formula. It's just, just you're just supposed to understand the philosophy that underlying these rational numbers are some integers. OK, so for instance, in an irreducible class, what you find is to leading order, to the first order of these BPS numbers are the gromov whitney invariants. There's no room for multiple covers or degenerate contributions. And then um, to next order, once I double the class in genus zero, let's say, I get this, this definition here. So this says I count my curves in class two beta, and then I need to subtract off a contribution from those in class beta, which have been multiply covered. And I subtract off the contribution given in genus 0 by this Aspinwall Morrison multiple cover formula. This is the prediction. And that is indeed what this formula tells you. And uh, we'll, we'll see something about these numbers later on. But th these are conjecturally integers. And indeed, they are in all cases. They'd be no, no, computed. Is, is, that, is that right? Yeah. yeah. OK. But I mean, just in this case, you mean? No, no, no for, well, for three dimensional Calabria, if you redefine the same GPUs of this cult, can't you? You mean this recent work of Ian Allen Parker? No, no, I think before. Right, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, any questions? That's Gromma Foot and Theory done. I don't know why they. Uh, can I ask a specific question? So there are also some denominators because of the genus? Like in the in genus one, because of the modular space itself being stacked, or is that not? not no, I'm just asking something stupid. Oh no, I think I just don't understand. Say again. So if if you look at genus one, there might also be some denominators from some kind of constant um, 
mm-hmm. constant, you know, maps map, map into a constant because of yeah, so integrals over moduli space of curves. Yeah. And they're all in there. Yeah. And what's the intuition for how to extract the integers that lead <coughs> What's the left hand side? Yes. No, beta. Yes. Beta non zero, I'm sorry. But but those those are all in there in the sense like in that, that cubic example I had. Yes. Where you have these degenerate contributions. So anytime you have a cur- imagine you have a P one, then I can glue on any of those curves you said to that P one and contract. So I get integrals over the moduli space of curves in that way, and they're all encoded in here. And this conjecture is that they all go away once I do this. So I guess the, the question is, in the genus zero case, you kind of explained to us naively why I expect there are integers around. Right. But, but in the higher genus case, what's the intuition? For the it? intuition, well, I mean, one intuition is uh, Rahul computed all these integrals over the moduli space of curves and uh, Faber, and uh, they got all these formulae. <laughs> I mean, I have no intuition, yeah. Grom of Witten theory is really a silly... I should be careful. <laughs> I mean, to, to try and understand the numbers is really a silly game, uh, in my opinion. One should not try and understand the numbers. I mean, maybe the generating functions, that's a different matter. I, I think going backwards, we would not have started with Grom of Witten theory if we'd, we'd chosen to try and count curves in a variety or something. Okay, so now we do K3 surfaces. So the virtual dimension of this moduli space is genus minus one. And the reason for the minus one is that I can deform my K3 surface so that my class, my homology class, is no longer of type one one. So then I can't possibly have any curves, so the answer must be zero. Okay, so all gromov witten theory is zero, and we can go. However, uh, the reason for that is the obstruction theory contains this trivial piece which tells you whether the curve class has any zero two part. And uh, that's what makes the virtual cycle zero. And you can remove this trivial piece and you get something called a reduced obstruction theory. And this has virtual dimension G in genus G. And you get reduced gromov witten invariants. And these aren't deformation invariant, obviously, um, but they're deformation invariant so long as I move my K3 surface inside the locus, inside the moduli space of K3s, where my class remains of type 1, 1. So this is called Noah to Lefschetz locus. And it's a divisor. So it's the divisor in the moduli space of K3s where the holomorphic two form pairs to zero against this, this curve class. Well, this is point to consider the germ of the Next slide. Okay. Yeah. But how do we simplectic on this and how it may depend on that? Symplectic are the same. How am I different? Yeah, so this is, these are not symplectic invariants now. This is algebraic geometry now. But well, you will see on the next page why it can also be interpreted symplectically. Okay, so, so you should think of, um, I don't know, elliptic K3 or something. So you have a one, the, the elliptic fibers have genus one, and indeed you have a one dimensional moduli space of elliptic curves. And uh, you can destroy that by deforming the K3 to no longer be elliptic, so that the, the curve class, the fiber class, is no longer of type 1, 1. But while you're in this Noah to Lefschetz locus, you expect it to be one dimensional, and that's correct. And indeed, in there, you have 24 singular fibers, and they give you zero, uh, genus zero curves, normalizing the, the nodal curves. And they indeed appear in dimension zero, and you can count them and get 24. And that's one of these reduced gromov witten invariants. Okay, so there's a threefold point of view, and this, this is what answers the question, two previous questions. So what you can do is take a disk in the moduli space of K3s. I'm not really telling you, I'm, you've got to pick some markings and so forth, but anyway. Uh, intersecting this Noah to Lefschetz divisor. So this is some kind of moduli space of K3s, and there's, here's this divisor where my class is of type 1, 1, so I might, it might contain a curve. And you take this disk, intersect it transversely, and that corresponds, obviously, to a K3 vibration. So these are all K3s. All the points of this disk correspond to K3s. So I get this K3 vibration over the disk. Um, with the K3 I care about at the origin. And uh, really what you're doing is considering curves in this guy, in the fibers of this guy, an ordinary gromov witten theory. And that changes the obstruction theory. So you can see the problem. I mean, this, this po- if you were just dealing with a point here, you could move it off this divisor, you get zero. But if you consider a disk, then of course, you can't move it off the divisor. It always intersects. 
Okay, so all curves in this fiber class actually lie in the central fiber. Uh, but you get a different obstruction theory, and you find the virtual dimension is now zero because you're in Calabi Land. And so the invariance about this torque is concerned with these invariants. You integrate one over that moduli space with that virtual cycle of, of virtual dimension zero. And you can express it in terms of S itself. What you do is you take that reduced class I was talking about before, and you integrate a certain uh, Hodge class over it, or lambda class, which is the top churn class of the Hodge bundle. All right, so any questions? This talk is about this, this number. So these are, these are the gromov witten invariants we think of as of the K3 surface. But really, they're the contribution. Actually, I might say it. There we go. They're the contribution of how this K3 surface contributes to the fiber-wise gromov witten theory of threefolds. OK, so these are really kind of threefold invariants. But these are the invariants we're interested in. Right, yes. But then one can relate it to the gromov witten theory of compact threefolds, which might have many curves where my curve class becomes of type 1, 1. I, I do that later. But for now, it's a non-compact threefold. And uh, you know, it's something like the twister threefold of the K3, but it's not really because everything's algebraic in this talk. But it's some kind of approximation to the twister threefold. Right. OK, so what's the cam katz klem waffer formula for these invariants? I rewrite them in BPS form by those universal formulae. So uh, these are now rational numbers which we conjecture are integers. And then two miracles happen. Not only do they turn out to be integers, but also they depend only on the square of the, the curve class, not on how divisible it is. So it's clear that these gromov witten invariants we've defined by deformation invariants and Torelli and so forth, they only depend on the square of the curve class and its divisibility. They're, they're the only invariants, really, of a homology class in a K3 surface. So they depend on how divisible the class is, how, how many times it's a multiple of another class. But these uh, BPS invariants do not. This is, this is some kind of incredible thing and shows you that BPS invariants are the right things to consider somehow. So. Uh, you know, if you're looking at curves in two times some class, you subtract off some contribution, as told to you by Gopakuma and Waffer, for the multiple covers of curves in half that class. And then you want to compute what's left. Incredibly, you can just forget about this homology class and go to a completely different homology class, which is, should have no relation. The only relation is its square is the same. And that homology class can be primitive. It's not a multiple. And you compute there, and you'll get the right answer. It's really incredible. And there, you know, the moduli space will be compact and so forth. There'll be no multiple covers. Whereas in your guy, you've got some non-compact moduli space, because you started with a compact moduli space with loads of multiple covers, and you took out some contribution from the multiple covers. OK, so that, that's part of the conjecture. And then the other part of the conjecture is it just computes them all in terms of modular forms. OK, so when, it, when you take genus to 0 here, uh, this becomes the yao zaslow formula. This becomes slightly more familiar. All, did I say? When you take z to 1, yes. When you take z to 1, what you get here is all that survives is the genus 0 part, and you get the yao zaslow formula. So when you take z to 1, this becomes 1 minus q to the n, all to the 24, this famous modular form. OK. So this is the kind of thing you'd want for general varieties. You'd want to know you get special functions, modular forms, or something, so that if you just compute a few classes, that determines all of them. So th this is true for K3 surfaces. Any questions? But there is no explanation of that non-numerical explanation. The modular form also kind of geometric objects. There's no geometric direct link. I mean, th this, this also comes up in the core. If you look at the cohomology of K3 surfaces and their, their Hilbert schemes, this also comes up, and then you know, there's vaguely geometric explanations to do with partitions, and Hilbert schemes clearly have something to do with partitions. Yeah, I, I think it's not satisfactory. That's correct. Yeah, and, and, and in particular in this talk, this is just going to be computed by brute force. OK, so in particular, you get these. Here's a table of numbers. These, these are the Yaz-Aslo numbers along the top. And these are really incredible. The fact that you get zeros down here are really incredible. So it says whenever you get a curve, of course you get all these higher genus curves mapping to it. 
They don't contribute to BPS numbers. They've all been taken out. They're all there in gromov witten invariants, but the, the BPS numbers have already removed those. You can get, all you get is lower genus curves mapping to your curves. So how do you get that? It's because you're only picking up the curves which are singular. When your curve to becomes singular, then you can get lower curves, lower genus curves by normalizing and so on. Uh, this number's kind of familiar. This is just the signed Euler characteristic of the linear system. So you take your curves and just take the projective space they live in, uh, the sections of the line bundle, and uh, take its Euler characteristic, and that's where this comes from. So these numbers are familiar, but then all these are pretty amazing. All right, so how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to degenerate. And so, um, as I said, Pandora, Pandora, Pixton proved this MNOP conjecture, which I haven't told you what it is yet, for projective threefolds, which can be degenerated to unions of toric varieties. So we're going to use that, uh, but that'll give a very, that's a very global thing. And we want to use some degeneration arguments to get a local MNOP conjecture, local to S, so for this kind of twister space. And, and then the multiple covers, once we've used MNOP conjecture to convert everything into this theory of stable pairs, which I also haven't told you about yet, um, the multiple covers become thickening, scheme theoretic thickenings of stable pairs. And one needs to calculate these, and, that, and that's not trivial, but we'll do that using some other tricks. There'll be a vanishing theorem and a calcula uh, localization calculation. Okay. So the classical of conjecture again is, is the fact that everything depends on the square of beta. Is that the yeah. conjecture? Well, the conjecture is two parts. It's, it's that and it's this formula. Okay, so I have to tell you what stable pair is. Uh, so this is more like, uh, so the slogan is gromov witten theory counts parameterized curves. And this is unparameterized curves. This is uh, just their images. This is uh, embedded subschemes, more or less. But you'll see why you can't get away with just embedded subschemes. It's a bit of a mess. So you, you use these things called stable pairs. So a stable pair formally is a pair, so a coherent sheaf with one dimensional support and a section which is stable. So it's the stability condition is that the sheaf is pure, as torsion free on its support, and that the section has zero dimensional co kernel. OK, so if you don't like that, a stable pair is a curve, a pure curve, no embedded points, no points knocking about. A pure curve, it could be non-reduced, it could be a thickened curve, but not just at points. It has to be non-reduced everywhere, if it is non-reduced. <coughs> it can be disconnected. And a zero-dimensional subscheme of that curve, or a divisor on that curve. Okay? That's, that's what a stable pair is. So for instance, if you just have a curve in a variety, you get a, a stable pair from it. You take the structure sheaf of the curve, that's your sheaf, that's the torsion sheaf supported in dimension one, and the section one. Or you might have a curve with a divisor on it, a Cartier divisor on it, then you get a line bundle on the curve with the section vanishing on that divisor, that is also a stable pair, so that's the curve with the divisor. Or you might get something where you get V divisors, it gets a bit more complicated. So a simple example is where you have the structure sheaf of two curves, let's say intersecting in a point, and you take the obvious section one. That has co-kernel wherever these curves intersect. So you take the trivial line bundle on both curves. Where you intersect, that's kind of got rank two in some sense. So the section only hits rank one subsheaf. And you get co-kernel at that point. So what you find is you get points at the intersection of C1 and C2. All right, so that's what a stable pair is. Um, they form a projective moduli space. Uh, that was proved by Le Potier. And uh, we fixed some numerical invariants. So before it was the genus and the curve class. Here, the genus is replaced by this holomorphic Euler characteristic of the sheaf. And the curve class is the same. And so this holomorphic Euler characteristic here is, if the, if the curve is, let's say, reduced, then it's 1 minus the arithmetic genus of the curve, but then plus the number of points. And this is a deformation invariant quantity, as you, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, until now, x is just a projective variety, but it's just about to become a threefold. 
smooth projective variety. OK, so an example is a surface. Uh, then uh, what you find is it's precisely this moduli space of stable pairs really is curves with points on them. So you take, I'll just tell you how to read this, you take the Hilbert scheme of curves in S in class beta. So if, if the surface has no fundamental group, this is just a projective space of sections of a line bundle. And you take the universal curve over that, and then you take the relative Hilbert scheme of points on the fibers. So this is really just curves with <coughs> zero-dimensional subschemes of the curve. All right. But for three-folds, which is what we're going to be dealing with in this talk, and this KKV formula is crucially a theory about three-folds, it can be written just in terms of K3 surfaces in gromov witten land, because all these multiple covers live on the K3 surface. But in stable pair land, you'll really need to thicken out of the K3 surface into a threefold. So it's really a threefold theory. So I'm really interested in threefolds here. So for threefolds, the genus can jump, which is why you can't just take the genus to be your, your uh, data up here. But it, it gets traded with a number of points. So this is the standard example. So you have two curves in three space. This can't happen in a surface. There's not enough room. And they cross, you move them until they cross. And at that point, you've, you've lost a point because they crossed here. And that point sort of bubbles off and becomes uh, the point in the stable pair. And then in a, a further family, you can uh, you know, move that point around the curve, smooth the curve. So in this picture, you can see the genus has increased by one, but the number of free points has also increased by one. And this quantity remains the same. Okay? And in flat families, that's always the case. And this is, this, this is the reason you can't just take subschemes. You can't just take curves as subschemes because these points can't start coming off and you get these curves plus points. Okay, so in stable pairs, at least the point is confined to live on the curve. And these are the moduli spaces we deal with. All right, so any questions about stable pairs? This is just curves with points on them. OK, so, so this result here says that they're very simple for surfaces. And we use that later on. For threefolds, they're a bit more complicated. They can't be described quite in this way because of this phenomenon. Now, for threefolds, now I'm going to work on a threefold. <coughs> I've formed this complex here in the derived category. You don't have to follow any of this. Uh, and its deformations minus obstructions have the same property as before. They have constant virtual dimension. So the, the, the dimension here remains the same. It's given by a Riemann-Roch formula. And it's the same one as before, because I'm in dimension three. This isn't true for, for surfaces. So uh, there's also a statement here that for threefolds, deformations of this complex are the same thing as deformations of the stable pair. That's certainly not true for surfaces, for instance. Um, for surfaces. You could imagine uh, this could be OX goes to OC, and then this, this complex just becomes O minus C. It just becomes the line bundle associated with the curve, and linearly equivalent curves will give the same complex. But for threefolds, the, this, this pair determines the, sorry, this complex determines the pair. And so you can do the deformation theory of this complex and find a virtual cycle of this dimension. OK, so this is the stable pairs virtual cycle. And so you get integer invariants now. There's no automorphisms anymore. And so I'm interested in the Calabiao case. And you get these integer invariants by just integrating one over this virtual cycle, or taking the length of the virtual cycle. All right, so if you didn't like any of that, you just need to know there are invariants coming from these stable pairs. So we count stable pairs on a Calabiao threefold. Any questions? OK, so now we come to the hard bit. So the, we need to degenerate to make our geometry simpler. So uh, I'll describe the general picture due to Jun Lee. He set this up in gromov witten theory initially. Um, but there's a similar theory in stable pairs. I'll concentrate on stable pairs. So what you want to do is you have deformation invariants of gromov witten invariants and stable pair invariants. As you deform the variety, the invariants don't change. But you'd like to deform the variety to something singular, in particular some normal crossing thing. And then you'd like to be able to compute there and get the same answer as you get for the smooth guy. So you know, morally, you think of curves on this central fiber here as being curves on one piece times curves on the other piece, but fiber product over that they must meet in the middle. 
They have the same boundary on the divisor in the middle. All right, that's roughly true. And that works fine so long as your curves have a boundary value on the divisor. So long as your curve intersects the divisor in a finite number of points, you can make sense of this, both at the level of moduli spaces and virtual cycles. But what you don't want is the curve to fall into the divisor. So if the intersection with the divisor is a whole curve, then you're in trouble. Uh, oops. So uh, what you don't want is this picture, where you start with a smooth x, you degenerate it to a union of two pieces, and uh, you're, you follow your curve along, and suddenly it degenerates to something with a component lying in the divisor. So if that happens, what you do is you blow up the total space of your family here, and you get a picture like this. This is the exceptional divisor. I'm assuming, I guess, that D has trivial normal bundle here. In general, this would be some P1 bundle over D. And uh, you get a new picture like this. Okay, so um, we're not just going to count curves in X1 and X2. We're also going to count curves on objects like this. And then again, this curve here might move over here and drop into a divisor. And then you've got to bubble again and bubble again. So this is like stretching the neck in Donaldson theory. Um, and uh, I should say, there's a C star which acts on this space, scaling the P1 fibers. And you want to divide by that. So if your curve is here, or you move it by the C star action, it lies over here. You want to consider those the same, same thing. So you want to form a moduli space of such things. So Jun Lee did this for gromov witten theory. And then with his student, Baozhen Wu, he did this in stable pair theory. So what they showed was there were moduli spaces of so-called stable pairs relative to a divisor. So I'm just doing one piece now, just x1 with its divisor d. So here's x1, and here are all the bubbles attached to it. And I'm trying to get out a, a curve here which has a well-defined boundary value along d. I can intersect with d. And he produced such a moduli space. So in this example, we've got four bubbles. There's a C star to the four acting. And you consider any stable pair two stable pairs equivalent if they differ by this action. And he formed, they formed such a moduli space of such things where no, no curves lie in D. They all intersect D in a finite number of points. And this is really a compact moduli space. So every time the curve tries to lie in D, you bubble again. And there's a complicated Artin stack of these degenerations with these group, these stabilizer groups. And they work relative to this stack. It's all very ingenious, and it works. OK, and you end up with a formula like this. So uh, the virtual cycle, there's a virtual cycle for this moduli space of these kinds of objects that I've drawn. And it has a map to the Hilbert scheme of D, given by intersecting with this final boundary divisor. And then you get this wonderful formula, which is the form I said before. You intersect in the Hilbert scheme of D. You take the boundary values of curves on x1, boundary values of curves on x2. You intersect, so you see where they match up. And that gives you a new virtual cycle, which is deformation equivalent to the virtual cycle on the original smooth guy. All right. Is that clear? Uh, I guess in the total space, so if I have a one parameter degeneration of a smooth threefold into this okay, okay. guy, then I get a family of moduli spaces and family of virtual cycles. Okay, so this is what we're going to use. So we start with our twister threefold. So we're interested in stable pairs. For instance, they're all going to lie on the central fiber, but possibly thickened out of it. And you know we can't compute there, because these damn K3 surfaces keep changing. They're moving across the base. Uh, and we degenerate. So uh, we replace this by its deformation to the normal cone. So I take this guy, I times it by C, I blow up S in the central fiber. And I end up with a new central fiber, which looks like this. OK, so I've degenerated this guy to this guy, where I've just bubbled off a, a P1 times S. <coughs> So what I'm doing is I'm, doing, um, I'm forming the relative moduli space of curves in T relative to S. So the curves can't lie in S, because then they wouldn't have a boundary value in S. They're supposed to intersect S in a finite number of points. And of course, here, that finite number of points is 0, because my curve class dotted with S is 0, because it's a fiber class. 
So what I want to do, I, I have to bubble and bubble again and so forth. And what I find is now my curves in this relative geometry of Jun Li must all lie in this piece. They can't lie in the twister threefold because if they did, they would have to lie in this crease here and that's illegal in uh, Jun Li's theory. They always intersect these, these, uh, these creases transversely. So they must all lie here. But now we've made some progress because here S is sat inside with, it's really trivial. It's really a, the trivial family of S. It's C times S. And we can use localization and so on. So what we end up with is, I didn't explain this very well, but Jun Li's theory tells you that instead of computing here, what you can do is compute here. So you end up computing curves which look like this. So we've essentially degenerated the twister threefold to its normal cone of S. And we end up replacing the geometry of just the twister threefold by this kind of geometry, where you're computing curves in these bubbles, uh, modulo these C star actions, and they all lie in the fibers. And you're in much better shape now because everything locally just looks like S times C. And now you can use localization in the C direction. So the, the first thing that's happened is we've degenerated to a moduli space which really depends only on S. All these curves here, they don't see the rest of the twister threefold. They're far away from it. So it really only depends on S. That wasn't clear to start with. It wasn't clear at all that my definition of state my definition of stable pairs on this twister threefold appeared to depend on the twister threefold. So even though the stable pairs do thicken and they stick out into the twister threefold, this invariant does only depends on S. And we have to compute it. And so we're computing curves of this form. And what you find is, uh, this is uh, what guys in this area call rubber because of all these uh, C star actions. So it's Effectively, we're computing uh, curves on P1 times S, but relative to this boundary divisor and this boundary divisor, and we only allow bubbles on this side and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the fact that really the twister threefold is attached over here changes the deformation theory. And what you find analyzing all that, and I won't go into the details, you find the following relation. So uh, maybe I, I just say why we're doing this. Part, part of the problem with stable pair theory is it's inherently a disconnected theory. Your curves don't need to be connected. In gromov witten theory, curves are always connected. So when you take this log, this is, like the, this is the connected stable pair theory. So this generating function here, once you take log, it's a generating function of new numbers, which you can call connected stable pair theory, if you wish. And we express that in terms of the invariance of this so-called uh, rubber space. So this is reduced invariance on this space made entirely out of S. Okay. So we now have these connected stable pair invariants defined by this. They're the generating function, the coefficients of this generating function. And uh, we prove <coughs> we've now We've now done two things. We've shown they only depend on the K3 surface. And we've computed them. Uh, we've shown, in some sense, how to compute them. We've related to this geometry here, which is rather trivial. And we can use localization on and We'll do that in a, in a slide's time. OK, but the first thing we do is we prove a so-called pairs no to less correspondence, because I want to use a global x, not just this twister guy. Because the global x, I'll have a so-called MNOP conjecture for relating it to gromov witten theory. So uh, the idea of this, you don't, this is a little bit hard to pass. And the reason for that is in a global K3 fibration, you can't just talk about classes on one K3 surface because they might be monodromy. So you have to sum over all classes which push forward to the same class on the threefold. So it all becomes a bit of a mess explaining it. But here, here's the explanation. So what this says is connected curves counting on a global projective K3 vibration come from the curves locally, this sort of uh, twister theory, the curves in one, one fiber, times by the number of fibers for which my class becomes of type 1, 1. That's the, this, the shape of this formula is very simple. All right? So it says, in general, you have a K3 vibration. How do I get curves in my fiber classes? I only get them when the K3 fibers lie in the Noah to Lefschetz locus. That's this contribution. And when they do, 
I get this contribution coming from the twisted threefold. OK. And uh, <coughs> there's a similar gromov witten node to Lefschetz correspondence, proof of stable maps, some time ago. This is a simpler situation because everything's connected and everything lies on the K3 surface. There's no thickening out. So there's a very sim similar situation. So we have, we can relate stable pairs on a threefold, a global threefold, to these local contributions. We can relate gromov witten theory on a global K3 fiber threefold to these local contributions. And then we're going to apply both to a specific example. So this is a K3 fibration. It's global, it's projective, and it can be degenerated to unions of toric varieties. And we choose this one because these, these correspondences are invertible. This formula here determines this. Once you know the Noah to Lefschetz numbers, it determines these numbers in terms of these numbers. All right. So once I know the, the global threefold invariants, I get these local threefold invariants, twister invariants local to the K3 surface. So if I can relate pairs to gromov witten theory, so if I can relate this guy to the pairs invariant of the global X, then I'll be able to relate these local guys. So I'll get a local MNLP conjecture. So we just choose our, our threefold very carefully so that I can invert this formula and I can deduce from the fact that gromov witten and stable pairs are related for this global guy, I can deduce that gromov witten and stable pairs are related for this local twister geometry. OK, and so the way we do that is this MNOP conjecture. I'll do this quickly. The MNOP conjecture is just a relationship between stable pairs and gromov witten theory. And you're not, again, you're not supposed to understand this formula. It's a preposterous formula. But um, again, you turn connected gromov witten theory into a disconnected theory by taking this exponential. You then get the stable pair theory, but only after this crazy change of variables. All right, but all you're supposed to understand from this formula is that the two sets of invariants contain the same information. And also, there are some integers underlying gromov witten theory. And why does this change of variables make sense? It's because part of the conjecture is that this right-hand side is um, the Laurent series of a rational function. So here's an example. And uh, this rational function is invariant under q goes to 1 over q. Not the Laurent series, but the rational function. If you put q inverse in here, you'll see multiply top and bottom by q squared, you'll see you get the same function. OK, so it makes sense to make this, this, this substitution. Yes? This formula looks formally very strange, because before you wrote the sum with the ground fit invariance was the sum with the BPS invariance. Right, I'm not doing that now. Well, but I mean, there was such a formula. Yes, I agree. And then that formula, in the special case, was, was a Jacobi form, which is a product. It was okay. a product 1 over 1 minus 3 to the end. So it looked like something you would take the log of. You take logs of products, you don't actually it. And this formula okay. looks very weird. Uh -huh. But you really are once taking the log and once exponentiating the same series. I mean, these things are much simpler in some sense. There's also a BPS formula of this. No, and no, you've. I, I know, but mathematics in general, if you're yeah. generating pumps that yeah, you I can't answer your question. Exponentiate, you might want to take the log, but I've never in my life seen one you do both in the same series. In one form, you took the log and you're exponential in the exact same series, and that looks very weird. Mm -hmm. No, no, but the story here is it's here we get kind of one dimensional shift. It's kind of have shift or and something around, yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the case theory, you, you do not in any. Uh, in the, Kind of sublattices, but shifted sublattices. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's somehow different in all process stuff, whatever it is. So, yeah. No, but don't, yeah. don't understand different. Maybe it's because it's a different X. I mean, there it's. No, I think no, no, same X, same X. Yeah. No, but wasn't it a collab? I mean, here it's a projected threefold, now it was K3. Uh, well, yeah, but it was part of a threefold. It was fine. One can. Formally, one can do all this for any threefold. And uh, that's right. All I was trying to say was, these, there's also a BPS form here. And these have become, when you see it, these become very simple formulae. They're all of this kind of form. They're, they're all rational functions with poles on the unit circle. They're all you know, q to the n's over 1 plus q to the n's all to some powers. And maybe, maybe there it's not so crazy to do what you said. I don't, I don't know. The formulae turn out to be not so bad. No, each formula is nice. They just seem to contradict each other. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not good with formulas. Yeah. See, by taking the log and once you simplify immensely, by taking the exponential, yeah. it's the same thing. And that's not. 
Yeah. You don't usually expect them. Okay. Okay, go on. It's just. Okay. I thought actually maybe it was just a misprint. You wanted the X on the other side. You, you really mean this? Yes, I really mean this. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually proved for projective complete guys, which can be degenerated to unions of toric varieties. So it's proved for this guy. And for this guy, I can invert those correspondences relating counting curves in the K3 fibers plus the counts of which K3 fibers my class is of type 1, 1, these no to left shirts numbers. I can invert that. And so I can deduce from their proof of the MNOP conjecture this local MNOP conjecture, local to S. So we get this kind of MNOP conjecture for this twist of threefold. All right. Um, so we're kind of, we've done all the MNOP stuff now. This gromov witten invariance that we want to compute has been reduced entirely to computation of stable pair invariance. So now all you have to do is compute the stable pair invariance. And as I said, remember, they thicken. They, they stick out of the K3. They're really threefold invariance. But we, we reduce those as well to this, uh, these computations on this so-called rubber, this uh, K3 times P1 with this group acting and so on. And you can further degenerate and localize on this, um, this rubber. And you can imagine now, you can reduce everything to computations on S times C, localize with respect to the C star action on C. And that's correct. OK, so you reduce everything to a computation on here. All right. So uh, we still have to do that. We have all the multiple covers correspond to thickenings in this direction. But all the, all the stable pairs are going, to be correspond, are going to be situated at S times the origin, because I localize. And one just has to compute. Now, <clears throat> so, so we can forget everything that went before. I just need to do a stable pair calculation. The KKV formula is now giving me a conjecture about what I get when I compute stable pairs on this guy. And now, there's several advantages of stable pairs over gromov witten theory. Um, and one of them here is that it has something called a symmetric obstruction theory. So half of you know what that is and half of you don't. It doesn't really matter. But roughly speaking, what it says is vector fields on the moduli space are dual to obstructions. And we used that before when we took this reduced theory. So um, you can take the obvious vector field where you translate along the C direction. And that's dual to the obstruction that we removed before to get the reduced obstruction theory under this said duality that comes up. And now there's another vector field, and that's going to give us a vanishing theorem. That's going to show, just as the previous vector field gave us this obstruction which showed the ordinary invariants vanish, and you have to pass the reduced invariants. Similarly, this extra vector field is going to give us a new vanishing theorem, a new obstruction which shows that the virtual cycle vanishes in most cases. So it's the following. What you do is you take a vector field on this moduli space, and it sort of flows outwards from the fixed points, the C star fixed points. OK, so what are the C star fixed points? You have, some, you have some stable pair, which I'll consider as just a curve. It's supported on the central fiber, but scheme theoretically, it sticks out in the C direction. And now I'm going to produce a vector field on this moduli space. It's not along this one. It sort of it takes you out of this one. And what it, what it does is I, I flow kind of the last part of my thickening here. So you imagine an n-fold tran transverse to the curve. You're imagining an n-fold thickened point and breaking off the last point to give you an n minus one fold second point and a, a separate point. OK, so one can write this down globally on the moduli space, but this is the basic idea. This gives you a vector field on this moduli space. All right? Sorry. The vector field literally does this in finite time? No, 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 no. Sorry, the flow does this, and then I differentiate it, and I get a vector field. There's a flow just local to here. So there's a flow on this. Sorry, there's a flow taking this into this. So it, it's as follows. I take my thickened curve, and I break off this point. Okay? And now I differentiate that at time equals 0, and I get a vector field. So on here, I get a vector field with sort of values in vectors in here. So I get a vector field which points into here, but just along here. I don't get it on the whole moduli space. I just get a vector field along here which points in this direction. OK? Does that make approximate sense? So this gives me a new vector field on here. All right? Not along here, on here. I, I don't know how to say this. Does everyone understand? 
There's a vector field on here, but it's not tangent to this. It's tangent to this. All right? But that vector field is the same <coughs> as the translation vector field that I mentioned on the last slide. Uh, that's just a weird property of deformation theory. Clearly, the flows are not the same. If I just translate this guy along the C direction, that's not the same as this flow. But to first order, when you work out the deformation theory, they're the same, so long as they do the same. All that matters to first order is what they do to the kind of center of mass of this curve, of this thickening. And uh, you can see that move, breaking off one point and moving it along the C axis uh, is the same. What that does to the center of mass is the, is the same as just moving the whole thing at 1 over d times the speed along the c-axis. OK, so you just have to believe me. These are the same vector field. When you say point, you have to move the curve to move off. Sorry, yeah, I'm thinking locally, transverse the curve. I've just got a thickened point, and I'm breaking the last point off. And what that does to the center of mass is move the whole th It's the same as moving the whole thing at 1 over d times the speed. Right? And this gives a vanishing result, because what you find is these two, locally, these two vector fields are the same. But if you move along the curve, if the curve has different thickenings, this d changes along the curve. And also, the curve has points. And if those points have d th different thickenings, then that d changes again. So what you find is these two vector fields are linearly dependent if and only if that d is uniform, is just constant over the whole curve. So what you find is that these two vector fields are linearly dependent only on the pairs which are uniformly thickened. So this is a uniformly thickened pair. You have a curve with some points on it, and you just times it by c and then intersect with the thickening of the central fiber. That's uniformly thickened. For that guy, this vector field gives you nothing new. It's just linearly dependent on the previous vector field. It's just a multiple of the previous vector field. But for something that's not uniformly thickened, this vector field is completely different. Because here it looks like a multiple, and here it looks like a multiple, but it's different multiples. So it's really, globally, it's linearly dependent. So what you find for that reason is, when you have a new vector field, which is over here, in the non-uniformly thickened guy, you have a new obst trivial obstruction, the virtual cycle vanishes. OK, so you get a vanishing theorem. So none of these guys contribute. You can just throw them all away. Only these guys contribute. So this is a multiple cover formula in stable pairs. And this is really much simpler, because the moduli space of these is just the moduli space of stable pairs on the original K3 surface, because the thickening bit is trivial. There's no information at all. It's just one integer. So we reduce, so that's that statement there. So we reduce this to a calculation, really, on the thin K3 surface with no thickenings at all. And so this gives us a multiple cover formula, and it shows that stable pairs satisfy this BPS formula and so on. And then finally, we just need to do this computation to get the actual KKV formula. And to get the actual KKV formula, uh, we just have to compute on this moduli space on the surface. But if you remember, I told you the surfaces are much better than threefolds. The moduli space is really a Hilbert scheme of points on curves. And so these calculations Martin Kuhl and I did a few years ago. and. Uh, <coughs> What you do is you express, this is the last slide, uh, the next slide is the last slide. You express this Hilbert scheme here as um, an incidence variety in this obvious smooth space. So um, in our case, the Hilbert scheme of curves in the K3 surfaces is just a projective space. You have your points on the curves. That's an incidence variety inside the space of all points on the surface times by this linear system. And the incidence variety is the obvious one that this curve here should contain these points. And so this is cut out by a section of a tautological vector bundle over this smooth space. All right, so there's the vector bundle. You look at your section, cutting out your curve, and you see whether it vanishes on these points. And so that defines you a section of a vector bundle over this space. And that's what cuts out this stable pair theory. And this really works at the virtual level. So what you find is the reduced virtual cycle on here is really given by this data. It's really the, just the Euler class of this vector bundle. All right. So you find the reduced virtual cycle is really just the Euler class of this vector bundle, at least after pushing forward to this big smooth ambient space. This is really a remarkable thing. You don't usually see moduli spaces as cut out of compact ambient spaces by sections of vector bundles of the correct virtual dimension. But this is unless you're you know, on a convex variety doing genus zero Gromov-Witten theory. 
But this is some one such case. And so you can really compute because it's just tautological integrals on Hilbert schemes. And what you find is this magic, the answer only depends on the square of the, the curve class. It doesn't depend on the divisibility. And this is where you find this, this other Gopper um, KKV conjecture, that the BPS numbers do not depend on the divisibility of the class. And you can really calculate it now. The moduli space is nice and holomorphic symplectic. You're doing things on K3 surfaces. Everything's very simple. And this, this calculation was done a long time ago by Kawai and Yoshioka, and you get the KKV for now. I think people are telling me to stop. OK, thank you very much. Can you add some variable to your formula because uh, they're refined? Uh, yes. Yes, you can. And um, you can almost prove it at the Gopakuma Vafa level. So if you look at the original Gopakuma Vafa prescription where you take these moduli of torsion sheaves and a vibration to a base and so forth, you can really, um, that works beautifully in this case. And it not only gives all of these answers, but it gives this refined version as well. It's also a refined form of Newton. Refined form of Newton. Because it's, it's everything stopped. You can try and push the refinement over the other side. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, say that again. Then what is the first one in Woodrow form in the refinement? I didn't hear that. Sorry. What's the corresponding model of form in the refined case? Um, I don't know the names of these things, but it's, it's, the, it's the one that people know from the Poincaré polynomial of the um, cohomology of Hilbert schemes of points on, on uh, K3 surfaces. So it's a very well-known thing. I can give you the formula later, and you'll recognize it, but I don't. More questions? Yes. Um, maybe it's the same question. Could you just go back? Well, the, for, the formula that I spelled, not the other one. You want to go right back to the formula? Well, the one with the, well, I mean, you don't have to show it. It's the one with the 1 over 1 minus q to the end, yeah. 20 and so on. So that, that function is a name, the function on the right. It's 1, oh, yeah. yeah. Up to a factor, if, if you, if on the left you put 2g minus 2 in the exponent instead of 2g. OK. Then the right-hand side would be exactly 1 over a Jacobi form, plus yes. 2 power of q and z. And it would be on the nose. And that Jacobi form is a name. It's called phi 10, 1. It's the first cusp form. Right. The smallest cusp form that there is 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 that one in the ten and index one. But then it can be moved up from a Jacobi form, which is a function of tau and z, to a function of tau and z and tau and z, the Ziegel form, and then it's the first Ziegel cusp form, the Gosso. That's the one that comes up in BPS state counting. So th this is where you change this to like x times y or something like that? No, 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 no? There's a, no, this is the constant. This, you don't change anything. This is the leading term in the expansion of the function that is a z, the same z, you don't change anything, z, q, but it's a q prime. Okay. And this is just the coefficient of 1 over q prime. But it's a whole Laurent series. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that Laurent series, again, is 1 over a cusp form. And that cusp form is this, equals the cusp form of grade 10. And that one has been studied a lot by people, including Buffer, because it's also BPS state counting for something in black holes. Mm -hmm. 150 page paper with two physicists about it, so I know it very well. So that's a function that contains a third variable, which is a Q prime. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also asking can one add that variable that's very different from another multiple variable, sort of another another elliptic variable. See, it's another multiple variable, another Q. Okay. So so I'll show you the I, I think it is almost certainly the same. I'll show you the formula later. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a general question about this uh, stable pair. So you said that you're thinking about this as a deformation of a certain particular type of objects in a derived category. Yes. So can, can this be generalized? I mean, can, can we also deform uh, I mean, other, other theories where we deform some more general objects in the derived category? Maybe Are you asking is there a theory of counting objects in the derived, stable objects in the derived uh, category? I mean, yes. In some sense, is, can that be viewed as a special case of that? Yes. Yeah, so this is a special case of the invariance of uh, Jan and Maxim and these generalized DT invariants. So, yeah, yeah. 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 because we consider stable pairs, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, local, like critical law law has some function, yeah? So it's a ship of finishing cycle. Mm -hmm. Consider commodities, it's a ship of finishing cycle. Consider one pair per Absolutely, and that's what gives this refined. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, thanks very much. Thank you.